Hello and welcome to your library at home. My name is M Mirish and I'm part of the library's public programming team. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet today on country. I live and work on Gadigal land and I take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and especially emerging. I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal people who are joining us today. Welcome to tonight's special event. This evening, we're joined by journalist and Camilla Rowe woman, Ella Archibald Binge, who will be in conversation with photographer and Palawa man, Rhett Wyman. Tonight, Ella and Rhett will discuss several photographs from their, jo their joint venture, the Dalaringi Project, which is supported by the Judith Nelson Institute. This project has sought to humanise the political rhetoric around Indigenous affairs. I'll see you all again at the end of the talk for you to put your questions to Ella and Rhett. So you'll see a little Q&A function um, within uh, on Zoom and please uh, put any of your questions there. I'll see you again at the end, but just before I do that, it's my honour to introduce Ella Archibald Binge, who is a Walkley Award-winning Journalist of the Year for, for this year, 2020. Uh, she began her career in regional newspapers before working at SBS and NITV. Ella currently covers Indigenous affairs for the Sydney Morning Herald um, and The Age, and she is supported by the Judith Nelson Institute. Now for our second speaker, Rhett Wyman is a Palawa man and photographer also for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Together with Ella, Rhett has been working on the Dalaringi Project, an initiative again supported by the Judith Nelson Institute, which is examining the important issues um, of our First Nations people. Uh, a reminder that um, tonight is going to be amazing and I'm very excited, but also this event does contain some graphic uh, images and explicit content, which may offend some viewers. Uh, but right now, hello, Ella and Rhett. Over to you. <laughs> Hopefully you can see it soon, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Emily, for that warm welcome. Um, we're coming to you from Camaragal country um, here uh, on the north side of the bridge, um, and we'll pay our respects to um, the Camaragal people's elders past and present. Um, as Emily said, my name is Ella Archibald Binge. I'm a Camilleroy woman from northwestern New South Wales, and I'm the Indigenous Affairs reporter at The Herald and The Age. And I'm here with my collaborator, Rhett Wyman. Um, Rhett, did you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a descendant of the Palawa people from the Oyster Bay Nation and the northeast coastal plains. Uh, grew up in Brisbane. I've uh, been interested in photography since I was 13. I uh, got interested through skateboarding. Um, I was fortunate enough to study at Griffith University in year 12, where I completed two years before deferring. Um, came back to photography about eight years after that to do a refresher and what had changed in photography since I'd studied. Yeah, awesome. So we're going to be talking tonight about our project, the Dalaringi project that we've been working on and our broader approach to Indigenous affairs coverage. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, Rhett, you were living in Brisbane. You're about to move to country Queensland to actually start a job in horticulture. Um, when you saw this ad for a photographer at, at the Herald and the Age, I mean, why did you choose to apply for that job? Um, so I'd always dreamed of working for a newspaper or a magazine as a sports photographer. Um, as I got older, my interests sort of changed within photography, but I'd always was keen to work for a paper. Um, leading up to possibly moving to Stanthorpe for a horticulture job, I was applying for regional papers, but just never heard back. Um, and I thought I'd just see if there was any photography work out at Stanthorpe and came across the position at the Herald and yeah, couldn't believe the position existed and applied, not expecting to get the job, but um, yeah. Yeah, you know. and then you did. So within a few months time, you've found yourself, you're in Sydney, um, you're a photographer at one of the country's biggest newsrooms. Uh, and this was your first time ever working in a newsroom and a hell of a year to, to start. Um, so you're running over this, all over the city covering multiple assignments. I mean, what were those first few weeks like on the job for you? Uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. <laughs> I'd only moved to Sydney a week before. So um, yeah, I was trying to learn how to navigate while working on deadlines. Yeah. Um, 
So that was pretty tricky. Uh, originally, I was meant to be following the staff photographers around for the first few weeks or first eight weeks or so, but um, it was sort of right at the height of the bushfires. And yeah, a lot because the Herald was giving such um, amazing coverage mm. of the fires, a lot of the staff photographers were out there. So I sort of um, jumped in the deep end because there was a lot of work coming up and we were understaffed. So yeah. Yeah, I remember it was, I felt like it was quite luxurious for me because I sort of had a month or so to kind of ease into the job, do some planning in the meantime. Um, you're literally doing multiple jobs a day and it was just yeah. insane. I hardly saw you. Um, and I think we had some photos um, from that uh, bushfire coverage someone so obviously it's a bit tricky you need um special training to be able to go out on the front line but you obviously couldn't help yourself and um just got some from a distance here at the blue mountains so hopefully if we can hopefully yeah so hopefully yeah. you can see that there on the screen but um talk us through this image yeah so just on a weekend i just scooted up to katoomba and um, this is the ruined castle fire um it was coming up the valley can see there's actually a helicopter there to put in the scale that speck on, on the clouds the there yeah um, so yeah this was it forming um this is december 4th and sort of just really in the coming weeks it got quite out of hand up there so. Mm. yeah so i mean it was just an insane time to be working in news um crazy start to the year of that horrific fire season um but in between all of this all your general news duties we were coming up for this plan for a major project that we we're going to work on together um so we had a pretty broad brief basically we had 12 months which we we're going to spend documenting the lives of aboriginal and torres strait islander people um, and we had funding from the Judith Nelson Institute, which meant we could travel while, while we could. Um, so we landed on this concept of the Dalaringi project. Now, Dalaringi means ours, yours, and everyone's um, in the Gadigal language, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So we worked with the Metro Land Council in Sydney to, to land on that word. But the idea behind the name was that we wanted all Australians to, um, to feel proud of our First Nations culture and history. Um, and by the same token, to feel that issues affecting First Nations people is something that um, we should see as a shared challenge for everyone to meet. So um, that was how we came up with it. And I guess through the project, we wanted to um, put a face to those statistics that we hear all the time and really humanise um, some of the political rhetoric around Indigenous affairs issues. Um, and, and obviously photos had a key role to play from the very beginning. So we're going to talk through a couple of your favourite photos from the past um, probably 10 odd months. Uh, but if you wanted to, I think if we start with the Vangara photos. So this um, was one of the first stories we worked on together. It was quite a, a controlled um, media setting. So we had a very small window of time to get this shot. Um, but talk us through how it came together. Uh, so this was a bit of an accident uh, <laughs> <laughs> leading up to it. Um, yeah, we only had a designated 20 minutes with the dancers, which resulted was actually even shorter once we got into it. Um, but so it was in a really dark environment. And I just sort of worked out where I was hoping to position the dancers and sort of got my settings correct. Um, since I had a couple of minutes before the dancers were coming out, I thought I would, they always say to just try and do the box tickers, I'll tick boxes mm -hmm. and so forth and safety, get, get the safe yeah. shots. And I thought it, I thought if I had a bit of time, I'd like to do a double exposure. So I started mucking around with getting the settings and the camera right. Uh, due to being one of my first jobs, I totally forgot to put the settings back to the original for the single portrait. Um, so, you know, I was shooting the dancers for a couple of minutes before, it must have been about five or so minutes before I realised that I had my double exposure settings still on. Mm. Uh, sort of freaked out a little, <laughs> uh, just kept rolling with it and then yeah, the dancers weren't able to hold the positions for too long because it was actually it wore them out and they mm. had to perform in the coming weeks. So, yeah, um, the 20 minutes was probably about 15 minutes. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't too sure exactly what I got until I you know, got on the laptop. And, yeah, the double exposure actually paid off. Yeah, a really happy accident. I mean, this, yeah, it's an amazing shot and it looked great in print. So yeah. did you tell, did you confess that it was an accident at the time? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too <laughs> so. honest. Um, yeah, so look, 
Great start. Um, and then we had our first road trip. We headed down to the south coast. Um, so I think we've got a couple of shots here. Um, basically, we headed down there because we'd heard about this aged care service, an Aboriginal aged care service that was about to lose its funding. So we headed down to Batemans Bay, um, spent a couple of days down there just getting to know some of the people involved. Um, yeah, it, we found another story. We sort of tried to get a couple of stories while we're on the road, but maybe if you talk us through um, your approach to these images for this one. Yeah, so that's Narelle who worked for Borussia and then that's uh, Norman. Norman had lost his wife about a year ago and he sort of just um, fell into depression, I guess, and um, just sort of really couldn't look after himself. Um, he was welcoming enough to let us into his house and to just sort of document what they, the services they provide and so forth and that. So it's just a matter of following Norel around and just sort of, you know, standing back and just, yeah, not mm. trying to be too intrusive, but at the same time, just, um, yeah, just documenting the work they do. And mm, I think it's, it's always tricky trying to be in someone's home and trying to capture something happening naturally. Um, yeah, when you're, you know, it's quite imposing with that, that camera, but I think, yeah, the, the, that did a really good job of it. Um, and then of course, while we were down there, we uh, picked up another story. So this one was to do with cultural fishing practices. So uh, a men's group down in Naruma that was reviving these um, sort of ancient fishing practices as sort of a, um, a health program for young men. Um, but yeah, I love this image. And I think this was all natural lighting, right? Yeah, so this is a boat shed in Naruma. Um, so there's some skylights and uh, window light and um, yeah, the light on their face is from a skylight. It was actually close to the middle of the day, but I'm quite lucky that it wasn't blown out. Um, so this is father and son, so Ian and Gran. And um, yeah, it was sort of their ancestors, once they got moved out to Wallaga Lake community, they were given uh, boats and nets and so forth and that which was able to provide food for the community and so they're just sort of revitalizing it and um, yeah they I just sort of wanted to capture them how they get to bond together and to bring back these practices that mm. they've lost and yeah, there was quite a few of those relationships in that program, like father and son or uncle and nephew. Um, and it was about that passing down of knowledge that had been broken previously. Um, yeah, it was beautiful. Um, so I guess our next uh, major trip, if we want to press on to those ones. So yeah, this, I mean, these are some of my favourite photos, I think, that we've, we've got in the project but um, so basically for this story we it was approaching um, Australia Day we wanted to uh, take a new approach to this whole uh, push to change the date of Australia Day and we sort of um, had heard about this um, massacre in Moree and I think it really highlighted some of the issues around why um, January 26 is a problematic date for a lot of Aboriginal people um, so there was actually um, a massacre here out near Moree on the January 26, I um, mean the 1700s. So on the same day in Moree, you would actually have uh, the Australia Day celebrations in the morning um, with sausage sizzle and uh, um, citizenship ceremonies and all of that. And literally as they were packing up the chairs, this morning procession is coming through town. Um, and then the, at the same park, they would have a very different, very somber event um, to commemorate that massacre. Um, so we basically, we, this is um, Aunty Polly, and we, we'd driven out about an hour from Moree on this bumpy dirt track um, to what is believed to be the site of the massacre. Uh, and I think this was one of the, the times where it was really helpful to have an Aboriginal journo and photographer working on the story. So um, a lot of the people that we spoke to um, were either distant relatives of mine or knew who I was that could place me because of my name. Um, and it was a really lovely experience. We could sort of talk about that and, and other things and they knew who we were and what we were all about. Um, so they were quite open with us and, and really willing to, to share what, uh, a lot about what is um, a very sensitive topic. So yeah, they'd taken us to this massacre site and we, we pull up at this dry creek bed and the sun's just starting to set. Um, how'd you approach this shoot? Yeah, um, so originally I planned to do, sort of wanted to take some you know, just standard portraits and sort of position them within the landscape. But once we got out there, I could 
see it was bringing up quite a fair bit of emotion within them. So I just sort of stood back and just documented them moving throughout the landscape. Because uh, I, I did need to get a strong portrait for, for the story. Uh, just after about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I just sort of asked if I could do a couple of group shots and just sort of position them more, more in the light. But um, yeah, a lot of my favorite shots from this was just more following them around and just documenting them mm, back yeah. in the landscape, so. Yeah, this is a beautiful um, shot of Arnipal. I love yeah. this one, yeah. So this, I really, I thought this really summed up the story because it's the Waterloo Creek massacre and this is the Waterloo Creek, which is literally dried up now. Um, yeah, well, my idea was to get a portrait of Polly within the creek bed, but um, yeah, I just didn't want to pose her too much. And I just sort of asked Polly to just walk within the creek bed and this was the result. So this is literally just Polly um, moving within the creek bed. She was actually collecting muscle, muscle shells that from the dried up creek bed had died and so forth from that. So. Mm. I, I remember when we got there, the first thing Arnie Polly said, we were standing on the edge of that creek um, and she'd said that, yeah, this place used to be beautiful and they, they destroyed it with killing um, and also, you know, as a result <laughs> with um, the poor land management as well. Uh, and I think, yeah, it just captured that emotion beautifully. Yeah. And this is just sort of, I just asked if I could get a group shot of them. But again, yeah, I just wasn't portrait. I uh, wasn't um, directing as such as I normally mm. would with portraits. And yeah, just sort of capturing them, looking out over the landscape. So. Yeah, and I think this is a classic example of, um, because the photos were so strong, it really elevated the coverage of this. So this was on the front page in the lead up to January 26. Um, it got this beautiful feature treatment on the website. And I think it just shows how powerful photos are in um, amplifying that, the story and, and drawing readers in. So at the end of the day, you know, it may, more people are going to read the story if they're drawn to the images. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, the portrait on the left, that was just um, Polly just moving within the landscape. So that was just one of the other ones of just capturing her emotion within the landscape, moving through it. Uh, the other one's Paul on the side, and so that was part of where I positioned him, but he, you know, he just raised his fists and it turned out to be quite strong as well. So. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Um, so we sort of uh, did a bit of a um, bigger road trip out west while we were um, on the road in New South Wales. So we also headed out to Brewarrina. Um, and so had, when we were out there, it was just um, a really strange time, I suppose. It was the middle of that bushfire season. Um, it was the, the height of one of the worst droughts in recent history. And at Brewarrina, that was, you know, really strongly felt because obviously the famous fish traps there, which are ancient, um, you know, structures that have been untouched for thousands of years were completely dry. Um, it was the worst the town had seen it for a long time. Um, but in the midst of all this, the town had started um, some of the state's first Indigenous fire crews. So it was quite a positive story. And it was at a time when there was a lot of conversations about um, cultural practices in land management. Um, so this was Burra. He was the captain of one of the crews and he yeah, took us out to the site of the fish traps. Again, that beautiful afternoon light. Um, yeah, I love these photos. Yeah, that was again. So um, yeah, like Waterloo Creek, I sort of had this idea to take some more portraits and sort of do what I traditionally do where I you know, find a location and position them. But I did a couple with that, with Burrow like that, but just just felt too rigid and wasn't working. So Burrow was um, good enough with his time. He actually just took, took me for a walk through the fish traps, which is actually generally flooded. And he'd actually never seen it without water in his lifetime. Um, so yeah, this is, this is literally us walking through the dried up creek bed as well. Um, and these stones are actually part of the fish trap. Um, he used to say that this was a rock that his, him and his mates used to jump off. So this is actually the, the fish traps all through here. And um, yeah, so it just sort of really summed up the situation that we're in at the moment. So the drought and fires and so forth and that. Mm. Yeah, it, was, it was amazing to actually see see the fish traps without water and to actually have the local knowledge and 
showing us around and mm. explaining all the history and the stories surrounding it. Yeah, and if you couldn't tell by that landscape um, what the, the sort of climate was like at the time, I mean, the drive home, it's quite a long drive home from Bree to Sydney, um, but along the way, it was just crazy weather conditions. So we just thought we'd throw in a couple of shots from, it was as the dust storms were passing over a lot of the Northwest. So yeah, a lot of stopping the car and jumping out to, <laughs> to grab photos. Stuff, yeah, I was <laughs> pretty keen to get home by that stage, yeah. but we uh, got a couple, yeah, it was just insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, so of course, it would, as we'd done these stories in the lead up to January 26, but then of course you were on the streets um, for the protests themselves in Sydney. What was that like? Yeah, it was um, different to actually be working the Invasion Day March, whereas I normally am a participant. Um, so yeah, it was sort of on, you know, uh, it was different. It was, it was definitely different. Um, Mm, you've got to walk that line sometimes, yeah, I think, is yeah. something that comes up as a, yeah, an Aboriginal person covering Aboriginal affairs. Yeah. Um, you do find yourself in those sort of positions. Um, yeah, but you can see that. I mean, you sort of look at the mask there and you think it's COVID, yeah, but yeah. that was back when it was um, bush fires, so, needed for smoke. Yeah, wasn't it? So, yeah. yeah, it was actually amazing. It was my first actual march in Sydney and just to see the turnout was, was amazing and mm. great. And, can definitely see there's definitely a lot of momentum behind it. And, mm. yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, this this photo is of, I don't know, um, I think most people in Australia will know of Latrell Mitchell, who's an NRL football player. This was at the head of the march. So the photo before that was, I shot that from a car park, which is literally just behind us. And I uh, ran down the stairs and just at the march, they just broke out into a traditional dance and yeah, just happened to be in the right place. And sort of just a lot of movement within the shot and just sort of summed up the day. So mm, I remember seeing that. That was quite prominent. I think that was front page yeah, at the time. Or it was, was quite prominent at the time. I mean, does it did you get the feeling when you took that shot? You said that that's a winner. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it was it was another shot actually. So you, yeah, the trail's right. a bit more prominent than that. I just I, I prefer this shot. Um, yeah. But yeah, you knew you of, had a good I, thing. I knew <laughs> I had, yeah, quite a strong shot. It sort of really just summed up the day and just sort of shows that everyone's there to support each other. It doesn't matter your background and so forth. And that. And mm. so, yeah. 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 Um, so I guess then we had our, what was probably our um, biggest uh, trip on the road, which we didn't know at the time, but uh, this was pre COVID when you could still. Um, do lots of air travel. So we headed up to far north Queensland for a couple of weeks. So we're doing a few stories while we were there. So we stopped off, we spent what, about a week or so in Cairns and um, a couple of days in Yarrabah, just out an Aboriginal community just outside of Cairns. Um, this was one of the photos we got along the way of these guys doing some net fishing outside Yarrabah, which is, uh, yeah. yeah, it captures it really well, <laughs> the vibe. Yeah, it's just nice. And yeah, and, and again, these guys were involved in um, the Kapani Warrior military training program for men from Indigenous communities up on Cape York, um, a really positive initiative. But yeah, I remember kind of sitting on a rock, eating my lunch, watching you knee deep, running around um, on these super yeah. slippery rocks, trying to get this photo. Yeah, just making sure I didn't drop my camera. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple other shots from this that I really enjoy, but I just sort of like the simplicity of this shot. And um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, besides not trying to drop my camera, uh, <laughs> it was actually one of the best locations to shoot in because it was quite a hot day and got to have a swim afterwards. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it was, it was beautiful to be up in the rainforest. And, and you have those shafts of light coming down, yeah, too, which were it. really yeah powerful in the images. Um, but, yeah, so the main story we were doing was up in Lockhart River. So this is um, a very small, very remote uh, Indigenous community up in Cape York. Um, as you can see there, it's massive, it's rainforest, but it also goes right up to the ocean. And um, yeah, we were there right in the wet season. So it's completely cut off basically from everywhere in the wet season. It's very isolated. Uh, so the reason we went up there is uh, we knew that the Prime Minister's closing the gap address, the annual address was coming up and we wanted to um, again, come at that from another angle. So look at, okay, what has this strategy achieved, particularly for remote communities? Um, so we spent five days on the ground out there. It was um, it was a bit tricky because 
very understandably, a lot of these um, communities have a, a real mistrust of mainstream media because often historically um, the coverage has been overwhelmingly negative or people just kind of fly in for a few days, aren't necessarily honest about their intentions um, and totally misconstrue what's happening in the community. So you do have to work quite hard to win the trust of people um, in these areas. Uh, and we had planned to kind of, um, we've been speaking to the mayor a lot, the local mayor in the lead up to the trip. Um, and he was kind of going to be our guide who would show us around the community. But as it happened, we actually got our dates crossed. Um, so he was in Brizzy for pretty much the whole time we were there, except for a very brief window when he got off the plane as we were getting on. Um, so yeah, we sort of spent a few days just getting to know people, telling them what we were all about. And um, yeah, how did you find it? Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, but yeah, not having the mayor there definitely made it tricky. Um, just as you said, they have a bit of distrust with media and so forth and that. And uh, just always having a camera on me, whereas on other jobs, <laughs> I'd be just, you know, documenting at whatever I see and so forth and that. But um, yeah, you, you have to be invited into these communities. And um, yeah, I just I had to approach it differently to how I normally would and just sort of had to stand back for the first couple of days and just, you know, gain people's trust and explain why we're there and mm. to work yeah. that way. I imagine it would be harder being the person with the camera because I think people see that and just balk a little bit yeah. um, if they don't know who you are. But yeah, they, I think, that, yeah, the community had gotten used to us a bit more by, by the end of the week. Um, but yeah, you'd spent a fair bit of time at the Arts Centre. Yeah, so they're actually, it's an internationally renowned Arts Centre and some of the artists were there at the time and they were, um, yeah, amazing. They actually really explained their work and sat down and conducted one of my first ever interviews. It was uh, <laughs> quite interesting. Uh, yeah, no, it was amazing to actually see the space which mm. they work and where these amazing artworks come from. Yeah, these are the, these are artworks that would sell for thousands of dollars as well. This is quite a renowned um, artistic community. Yeah. 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 Silas on the left is an artist and um, one of the elders on the right. Yeah, you always come across a lot of characters around town. I yeah. think so there's always a good um, potential for portraits. <laughs> um, and yeah, so a lot of the this story was centred around children. So we spent a lot of time at the early learning centre, and um, I think everyone always loves photos of kids. Yeah, and yeah. The winner, exactly. um, and this one was splashed across the front page um, the day after the close the gap address. So that was I think that was really powerful. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a happy, happy shot. So yeah, it's great. So yeah, it just came up to my lens, and yeah, lucky to have the settings right. So. <laughs> This was a mother and daughter, so. Yeah, we were looking at, I guess that's how we'd um, entered the story because they were talking to the mums who wanted the best for their kids and then looking at um, the challenges that, the, that they were up against in that community and, and um, the help or lack of help that they had to get there. Um, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And then this was one of the indigenous rangers so they were doing cassowary monitoring so they got to take us for a walk out in the jungle and mm. not the jungle the rainforest so. yeah but um yeah it was pretty rugged and they were having to cut their way through the time so it was just um yeah i think you a, enjoyed this one <laughs> yeah this is definitely more up my alley so um because we we're up in lockout during the wet season we couldn't actually really venture too far from town at all so uh, just due to the roads get flooded and you can be stuck for, yeah. With no phone reception, <laughs> no so phone yeah, it's a bit well, limiting. So, yeah, in the, um, yeah, you sort of had to stick to the places. Mm. Yeah. Um, so a total change of pace, we were back in Sydney and we were doing a um, feature for Spectrum. So this was looking at the Biennale, uh, which had its first, um, for the first time had an Indigenous artist curating it. And as part of that, he'd invited a whole heap of amazing First Nations artists to um, from Australia and also across the world. Uh, and these are, yeah, all, all sort of very set up portrait style shots. Um, yeah, what do you love about these shots? Uh, yeah, so this is just before the lockdown with COVID and that. And so these are all international artists besides, uh, well, four of them are international mm -hmm. artists and Tony Elbert's Australian. Um, so they were all over here for the Biennale and I was just, yeah, had the pleasure of being able to take this group shot and 
before all the rest travel restrictions came into place. Um, yeah, so we'd, we'd planned to do the shot, the five artists, but um, it was, I didn't know where the location was going to be all that. And um, we had a media preview and that week we went over to Cockatoo Island and saw the amazing warehouse and just sort of had the space to be able to do a portrait with five people and just beautiful natural light, even though I've used a bit of flash in this as well. So, yeah, and yeah. I imagine it'd be good to have that chance to be able to suss out the location, yeah. which has been pretty rare in yeah. our work. It's usually, yeah, normally you have five minutes, mm. and five minutes to meet the subject and decide on the location. So, mm. it's, um, yeah, definitely working in news is you have to be, you've got to follow your gut a lot more. And yeah, with it, so. yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah. yeah, and so these are just some of them had to do individual portraits over there as well. So, mm. yeah, okay. Yeah, but again, seeing them all, um, yeah, displayed, I think, in print, it was really, really beautiful. Yeah, so, and definitely felt a bit more pressure with Spectrum, so. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, yeah. It was sort of all one way. Yeah, well, I guess that's the thing. You've been working across such different, you have to be really adaptable because you're yeah. doing stuff, you know, from remote communities up in Lockhart to shooting for AFR in a corporate office the next week. So yeah, you just yeah. um, never know what's coming next, no, I no, guess. No. So you really have to think of your toes. And, uh, I love it. It's a lot of problem solving, so. Mm. Um, so yeah, sorry, a couple more of yeah, Tony there. Some of the beer. Yeah, that was from a crane, wasn't it? This one on the yeah, right. on the right. So, so it's actually been quite prominent work. So it's to do with um, yeah. It's the shadow of that Captain Cook Captain statue. Cook's yeah, statue, yeah. yeah. So. Talking about history and yeah. So yeah, yeah very topical. Yeah, it did, <laughs> especially with all Black Lives Matter and so forth. And that, and, uh, yeah, everything going on. Mm. So I guess it wasn't long after this that uh, COVID happened and really uh, changed everything in terms of our plans for the project. We had a real big wish list of stories we wanted to do. Half of them were, you know, in the NT or WA or, you know, we definitely planned to do a lot more traveling um, to remote and regional areas. Um, but yeah, so I sort of went off and worked on some other stuff. And uh, yeah, obviously you were thrown into um, yeah. covering all things COVID. What, what was that like? Uh, yeah, so it was quite eerie um, being, <laughs> being allowed to wander the streets while everyone else is in lockdown. So it was actually, yeah, it was, it was very strange. So this shot here is actually at like 10 o'clock in the morning at a, you know, central mm -hmm. food court in the city, yeah. which should normally be bustling. But um, there was like two restaurants open and it's a store owner walking back to a store. Mm. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was uh, yeah, I don't think do you, I'll ever experience anything like that again. So Yeah, like do you have a sense as you're getting these that you're really capturing a moment in history? That this is something so strange and unique and, and you know Yeah, definitely. Like um wouldn't say it's like a one image, but I think it's just literally documenting that period and so forth and looking back at it, yeah, definitely. I, mm. I hope it does have that gives that sense of time and history and so forth from that and just yeah that's going on. it's definitely so. looking at some of those photos that's how i <laughs> captures the, the feeling i think when you go for a walk these days yeah. it doesn't quite feel the same no so, yeah just sort of yeah just really popular destinations that are generally bustling with people but um yeah mm. yeah there was no one around this day it was, it was crazy and i just sort of popped out of the side street with a shot and yeah he, he was just jogging and actually didn't realize i was there so I think it would have changed changed the shot if he didn't realise I was there. I think he did yeah. a second later. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, just on one of the ferries in Circular Quay that you know this is at peak hour normally. So these would be just packed full of people commuting from work to home. Mm. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. 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 So that leads us to I suppose the next huge event to happen this year, um, which was particularly massive for us, which was the um, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what did it feel like to be on the streets covering this, particularly this massive, this one protest in Sydney, which was absolutely huge? Yeah, so literally this was just as lockdown restrictions were easing. So just going from the city that I was showing before, <laughs> uh, to having no one in it, to having over 20,000 plus people uh, within the centre of it. It was, mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely an experience. Um, yeah, I just sort of felt a bit of a responsibility to really document as strongly as I could. Um, 
Yeah. Is that something do you think that's kind of magnified because you being probably one of the very few, if not the only mm. Aboriginal photographer, um, you know, press photographer at these at these sort of events. And yeah. It must be something that you're conscious of. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, really want to give it. <laughs> get it right. <laughs> get I guess it right. it's that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. definitely responsibility and um, feel that the platform I have to be able to reach people that wouldn't necessarily go to these Mm. Um, protests and so forth and that and uh, uh, yeah really just capture it in a truthful way and yeah that's, yeah that's, that's, absolutely i mean yeah it's more of these stuff yeah. I mean, what was what was the mood like when you were um so yeah throughout the day it was, it was amazing actually it was quite powerful mood so you know there was um it was, it was really positive to just see everyone coming together and um uh, being there for the one cause and such and I don't know it just it really felt like a pivotal day within mm. the movement and so forth you know people have been fighting for change for you know, decades and not, not mm. like yet centuries so yeah I guess that's the thing and I, I know that as a you know an Aboriginal journalist who's been working in this space for a long time this isn't a new um, topic you know death in custody is something that um, we've been reporting on for you know decades longer um yeah, so it's, uh, I think there was a bit of that frustration that why does it take something in the US to, to bring the attention on it, on that here in Australia. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I, I know that, you know, the community here is really good at capitalising on those moments and, and harnessing that momentum. Yeah. The mood may be starting to shift later yeah, in the day yes. here. <laughs> so yeah, this is um, after the official march. And so, yeah, there was definitely some, I guess, built up of uh, anger or so forth and that. I don't know, there was a bit of frustration, I guess, just with everything going on. And um, yeah, after the official march, it sort of uh, just got a bit more vocal on the street, I guess, but uh, didn't exactly help with the large police presence. Um, yeah, I was, I was there and, and police sort of surrounded the protesters and which I've, you know, I, I could understand they were hoping to disperse the protesters, but it was they sort of pushed the protesters into the central train station where I got stuck, which I found quite ironic that we're in the middle of a pandemic and they're moving large numbers of people into a enclosed mm -hmm. environment. Um, so there was um, yeah, there was shot coming up. So that was just the walls. When you were all concerned at this point that you might be that you were going to be moved on or do you just sort of go into your own world and, and just, it's just you behind um, the lens? But yeah, like um, I want to be there and I want to be documenting it and it's sort of my job. So yeah, I, I got to, I guess I got to show the two sides of the story, you know, document what what the police are doing, what the protesters are doing. So sort of being mm. important. So you weren't going to be, you weren't going to be leaving? No, <laughs> no, I wasn't leaving, no, so. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is sort of once we got pushed into the central train station. And I think just having the large police presence really just probably put a bit of fuel on the fire. Like the, they, everything was peaceful. It was, mm -hmm. it was quite vocal and so forth. Um, but yeah, no, I, I just, I, I found it quite ironic that <laughs> it was pandemic and, you know, we've been meant to be socially distancing and we got, Heard it into a mm. into central mm. train station. Yeah, so. after all this, to sort of yeah. shut it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah just sort of showing it more poignant. <laughs> yeah, sort of really summed up the year as such. And in the front, you can see hand sanitizer and a, a mask. So, mm. so yeah, so. what a year! What a year to start working in news. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Interesting>. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I guess. Uh, after this has happened, we, it was obviously something we wanted to look at through the project as well. So um, we were able to hit the road again as restrictions started to lift. So I've been uh, publishing a couple of stories around Black Lives Matter and justice issues. And we got some feedback um, from a few people in the Northern Rivers area in Northern New South Wales. Um, so we went up there for about a week and we were looking at um, you know, what, what does Black Lives Matter mean for people on the ground? What, how do these interactions between Aboriginal people and the police, um, the, just, the, the courts and the prison system, 
um, play out in, in everyday life. So as part of that, we, we spoke to, you know, a whole group of community members, lawyers, um, current and former police officers. We attended a protest, tagged along to a court day with um, Aboriginal Legal Service. And yeah, I, I love this portrait. So this was from um, our debts in custody, the, I guess the third instalment of that three-part feature series, which looked at um, the prison system and the toll that that's taken on families. Yeah, yeah this is Karen. Her brother died while in custody. Um, it was, um, yeah, I just really wanted to put a face to family member who's, who's lost someone in custody. Um, wanted to put her within the landscape, but I just felt these trees sort of gave a sense of, you know, jail, like a prison cell as such. Um, yeah, I think as the day went, like Karen, with her sharing a story and then posing for the photo, like at first she was quite shy, but I think it was, yeah, quite an experience for her and see how powerful she was and how much she's been through. So. Mm, yeah, I don't think she'd done a lot of media before this and she was quite anxious about it. And yeah, we spent sort of the best part of the day with her. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it, as you said before, it was quite cathartic for her talking through her story. Um, mm. And you mentioned that you shot this from a low angle for a specific reason. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to give her a sense of power and so forth and that. So mm. yeah, just sort of um, wanted it to be a positive yeah. Positive, powerful shot, but um, at the same time. Yeah. yeah, and I think I remember um, when we showed Karen this photo after, I feel like she was quite um, sort of pleasantly surprised. Like, I don't think she'd necessarily seen herself in that way um, as being so powerful and, you know, this the stuff that she, everything she's been through and she's such a survivor. And I, I think, I hope that it was an empowering experience for her. And I think in this photo and in our work, it's something we've always tried to do is to lift up those Aboriginal voices and amplify that and really prioritise that and put that at the centre of, of all of our coverage. Um, and yeah, there was another great yeah. portrait of Karen's cousin. Yes, indeed. So she's quite prominent in the Northern Rivers and organising protests and sort of being a voice for people that generally don't speak up about these things. So. Mm. And, and again, this is, this is quite a, I guess it could be a grim story, um, but these photos, don't feel I think they're honest like they show the pain but it's also something hopeful about them maybe or, yeah. or that is celebrating the the women themselves yeah um, definitely that was something I was wanting to put within the pictures so yeah now it's the topics are quite um yeah so heavy heavy yeah. yeah so I sort of really wanted to just show them in a positive light but they still also really show the strength and power within them so mm. yeah yeah, and is that where with the sun coming in? I know that was kind of that was in both of them. Is that yeah, part that of was, creating that? It was I get uh, wasn't intentional at first, but the, at, throughout the trip, um, but yeah, it was just sort of something that seemed to pop up, and it sort of just really gave that sense mm -hmm. of hope, but also um, yeah, it was just just noticing it's almost on, like a replica of the flag there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was um, yeah, very keen. <laughs> Um, so look, I, oh yeah, this one, yeah, I forgot about this one, I love this shot too. Um, yeah, this was a mum who we'd spoken to, um, who'd had, a, again, a negative experience with police. She'd actually sued the police because they had locked up her son, not the one pictured here, but um, another one of her sons in the back of a police van and forgotten about him. Um, and yeah, only found out when she went down some hours later to, to figure out what had happened. Um, but yeah, she was uh, really open with us as well, um, let us into her, her home and, um, yeah, I love these shots. Yeah, so it was Jane. And yeah, originally I thought I'd use use some flash in this one, but um, just moving around the area, I just decided that available light was best. And the idea was to get a, a son to sit on her lap, but um, being young and very fidgety, just kept moving around. So while I was just doing light tests and sort of working out a shot, it came about. And yeah, it's quite a quite a strong shot I feel mm -hmm. and so you can see her motherly love towards him yeah just uh, yeah he was quite restless but I think it ended up making the photos yeah, and he was there and yeah you can see that beautiful bond yeah, yeah it's lovely 
Um, so I think maybe that's the end of the images for the project stuff. There's a couple of others if we've, we're probably running out of time there. So interrupt us, Emily, if we are. There's, I think there's probably two others. Um, this was a recent one. This is a really positive story. I love this photo. I love the story. Um, this is Carly Noon. She's an astrophysicist, a Gamilaroi woman, um, and she's just incredible. She uh, basically comes from a low-income background, um, growing up in Tamworth, and she'd struggled with school. She actually dropped out um, in, early in high school, uh, but found her way back with the help of a local Aboriginal mentor. Um, yeah, she's just so inspiring. And you got these shots on a freezing cold yeah, night was, in Canberra. Yeah, it was blowing everywhere. Yeah, Almost crazy wind. Light. The dress and hair was going everywhere. So this is when I fluked between the gust of wind. <laughs> uh, originally, I planned to try and shoot it at sunset, but um, just moving the telescope and all the gear, and it was a bit of a little bit of a walk in down path. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was came up quite well considering the circumstances. So I was working on a deadline that they were hoping to use in the paper the following day. And so, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's always stressful, I imagine, when you're in the middle of a shoot and you get a call saying, we want this for the yeah. front page, you need to get it to us yeah, ASAP. Yeah. Um, so ringing, so. yeah, but I mean, you know, I think you stuck to, your, your priority was getting the, the shot and I think that was... Yeah, yeah, so I was, I was really pushing it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so... Yeah. You know, I was, Glad, I'm glad I did because mm. it was in Canberra and it's a day trip and so you want to try and make the most of it. Yeah, oh, and the shots are beautiful. There's just quite a few of them that were really lovely. Um, and just lastly, so this is kind of a teaser, I suppose. Um, it hasn't been published yet, but uh, as part of our kind of the way we've shaken up our plans with COVID, we're working, um, we're working on a podcast series and what Ellie here is in one of those episodes. Um, Ellie is a stolen generation survivor and who, who tells a beautiful story, um, tragic and, and yet beautiful. Uh, but yeah, we were lucky this is, we were able to escape Sydney um, pretty soon after the COVID restrictions to Katoomba and get these beautiful shots with Ellie. Yeah. How'd you set this one up? Um, so it's, it's obviously the light um, flash in this. Um, it was just late afternoon. Yeah, just, I don't know. Did you direct her to look like that? I'm just starting because no, usually no, it's a, was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, a lot of the time I don't like directing people too much. Um, but yeah, and so, a lot of the time I get my favorite shots when I'm just doing light tests and I'm pretty sure this was during mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, Ellie just had an amazing um, She's very at ease, yeah. So, yeah, she yeah. was she was wonderful to work with and just extremely comfortable. Um, which, I wouldn't be if I was in front of the camera. <laughs> no, <So>. me neither. <laughs> um, look, I think that pretty much sums up our photos. Um, so we can throw back to you, Emily, if you're still there. <laughs> Thank you. My goodness, just breathtakingly beautiful, um, the images and also the content. Um, I'm speechless. However, <laughs> others have asked questions. <laughs> So let's dive in and just for any, um, we've got a little bit of time. So if anybody would like to put a question into the Q&A function, please do so. Um, so Rhett, our first question, I think this goes back to when you showed us the, um, the dance company. Uh, do you prefer photographing in the studio or out in the real world? Uh, real world, I love shooting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I've grown to love doing portraiture actually, which I didn't think I would. <laughs> um, and I love sort of controlling. Uh, it's I used to always work with available light. That was sort of what I did, but sort of um, within the different jobs I have to do at the Herald and that we, you know, we have to learn how to control light within working on location and so forth and, and portraits. So uh, it's definitely definitely changed. <laughs> so but I love more just um, just general documentary and just wandering the streets and that still. So yeah, uh, so maybe that maybe that's why you got the the timing wrong with the Bangara, just so you can mix yeah. it up a little bit. So it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, another question we had, which was um, love the talk. Um, and when the restrictions are lifted, um, Ella, you started to say a little bit more about where you might be going. Can you give us a little more of that teaser? 
Mm, great question. Uh, <laughs> well, it's kind of an interesting one. So in terms of the future of the project, it, it's going to continue in some form um, for the next 12 months and there's going to actually be two Indigenous journos and RETs staying on. So that's exciting. I'm actually moving over to the ABC, but someone will be taking my place. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, we definitely, I know that we'd spoken a lot about, um, I know Rhett, you're really keen about environmental stuff. And so, I mean, for an example, one of the things we really wanted to do was look at um, the impact of things like um, mining in a community. So look at somewhere maybe where where that's wrapped up and look at the aftermath of that and, and what has it maybe achieved for people in terms of economic benefits, but what's been the, the consequences as well. Um, I think we honestly had a massive list of stuff. And like, I think when, yeah, I don't know, I can't, it's up to you, I guess, right? You gotta take the reins <laughs> and uh, figure out what you wanna do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> well, I think a lot of environmental based things, I think that really affects the community and so forth. So it's been for me as well, but um, I think just access to water and food and different things. I, I, that's something I'm, I'm quite interested in. Um, but yeah, well, I'm just going to see where it goes with the restrictions. Really. Mm, and, and, not, and we did want to get back to Tassie to too, because Rhett's got yeah. you know, his um, ancestral ties are to Tasmania. Yeah. So that was that was on our wish list. So hey, maybe you'll get yeah, done there. <laughs> this is there again. Yeah. So another one of the questions which was um, over those the, the reach of the photos that you've shown us tonight, is there one in particular, a person or an instance that stands out? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, I think a lot of the, I don't, were, were you, what do you reckon? Was there one that you remember seeing that was really prominent at the time? Um, uh, I couldn't say there's just one. Uh, for me personally, I think it's just like last matter protests. I don't know, it's really, I think it just summed up the year for me and it just there was something about that day for me um but i think waterloo creek massacre as well was another one that was sort of one of my first stories and story and to be allowed access to document somewhere that was so against them uh yeah, yeah. So, but Sorry, I can't mean to jump no, in no. time. Um, I was just going to say, off the back of the Black Lives Matter protests too, I think the the three part series we did on the the justice series in Northern New South Wales, I remember, like we had a, a front page image for that, and then a quite a massive like two page spread with heaps of images. And I just saw that, and I'm like, wow, like it's just sometimes it's a bit surreal to see that, in, and you sort of got to take a step back and think this is a national paper um, yeah. to get that kind of coverage. I think I just don't, I don't think it would have happened five. Ten so it's, um, that was that moment. And is that why the Black Lives Matter images are in black and white? Is there some? Uh, it was more just for the day and just the change within the days and going from in the temporal, that was at night and so forth. And that, it just, for me, it just tied it in together. Um, yeah, like just, uh, I don't know, I just wanted to make it a little more of a series and so forth and having it takes a fair bit of editing to think uh, <laughs> consistent, and especially when you're working on like that was for me personally a bold color, but I'm um, just for a little series that I and at the same time I think it's quite poignant as well. So just um, yeah, I I yeah. used to do black and white a lot when I was younger. That's <laughs> There's, um, there's another question about your, your style, which is, um, and I'm going to expand on it a little bit. It's saying, the question is, do you prefer portraits or landscapes? But through your discussion, um, people are placed within the landscape. So there's a fusion of those two. Can you talk a little bit more about this portrait and landscape and the fusion? Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm finding is kind of more part of my work. <laughs> so uh, I, I just feel and especially covering Indigenous affairs and so forth, I think it's it, it really just ties back to that, having such connection to land and so forth and that. And so uh, I definitely love to position people within the landscape, but being natural and so forth and that. But uh, I don't like to pose people too much, so I just like to sort of capture moments when they're putting themselves within the landscape. So they know I'm there to take portrait and so forth, but it's a fine line. It's, um, it's, yeah, I, I definitely. Mm. So 
I wonder if uh, I'm not sure if if, if the question it, it might be also if they're talking about it as in a vertical or a horizontal image. Yeah. That's something that the paper kind of said at the start that, or that you were told kind of by the photographers that the, the preference is generally the, the horizontal images yeah. yeah. for print. Because I think that was a bit of a shift. It is for me. Well. So, uh, some reason, I've always simply shot them all for print as much in landscapes. So, it's, I don't know, it's just a format that I've preferred. But um, yeah, with paper, I know it's because they're so beautiful with that golden glow that whether you're you seem to have an attraction to the morning or the afternoon light where there's just that magical glow but looking at them you so it seems as if you're pushing the, the the film or the camera to its limits to capture the detail so is there a challenge in that to capture that golden light but also the clarity of the image yeah definitely so it is a matter of day but you don't always get the opportunity to dictate that it's sort of like a lot of the times it came in the middle of the day or so forth and that so then you have to work around those limitations and sort of move into the shade or just it's really understanding the time of day that you're shooting but i i, I don't shoot in the afternoon or the morning so i know if i'd be like we've got to shoot at two o'clock he's like oh can we push yeah. it back to <laughs> five or <laughs> so ella it seems that you're Ella, it seems that your journalism fries on that same pushing it to the limit in terms of where you'll take yourselves and across the country. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was something, and you, gotta, you do fall into a trap because it's not just, you know, that you need to go regional or remote to find Indigenous stories because, you know, biggest populations are in the cities. But uh, I think it's more that we had the budget to do that, which people is quite rare sometimes these days. And also, I think it, with you know the collapse of so much regional media, unfortunately, because that's where I got my start. But I think that there's so many untapped stories out there, um, so it was important for us to to get a good mix. Yeah. And what has been just one more question that's just popped through? What has been the response of the Delaringi project um, for the broader First Nation community? Yeah, well, I think the last few months as we've been wrapping up, there's been a lot more, um, a lot of interest in it as we've sort of been recapping um, some of it but yeah I think broadly the approach has been really well received I think it's been well received by uh, readers as well which is um, it's probably a, a different well it is it's a very different audience that um, we're catering for here as opposed to when I was at NITV where we have a predominantly Indigenous audience so um, I think there's you know that's I, I hope that we've shown that the need to cover Indigenous affairs as a dedicated round and you know for it to be um, importance for that to be led by Indigenous people wherever possible. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's been well, well received. I don't know if you've yeah, got well, any sure. specific yeah. feedback or. <laughs> yeah, and I, dare, dare we say well received, yeah. like this evening's talk? <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we were just talking to the void here. I don't know what people are thinking. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can see from the responses of our questions, it's just been a delight um, and, and often breathtaking and beautiful and, and quite moving. So for you to share that with us has been really, has been really, really special. Um, I think we're coming close to the time where we will, where Zoom will cut us off. Um, so I'll just say, oh, look, now we're just getting, we're not getting questions, we're getting statements, which was brilliant. Thanks. Um, and beautiful. Really, really moving. So um, thanks again for giving us your digital time and coming to the library digitally, um, Rhett and Ella. And we will all, we can find the link to the Delaringi um, through the link that was advertising this talk. Is that the best way to find it? Or we go through Google? What's your... Yeah, you can do either. I think if you Google Dalaringi project, um, it'll probably come up for you and all the stories are tagged for that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, follow the link, follow us on Twitter, either way. <laughs> Wonderful. And then uh, with one minute left, I can do my little plug, which mm -hmm. is we have more talks at the library and more events. So how everybody found this this evening um, on our What's On page. And we have many more events at the library. So please check out our What's On. And um, Retinella, thank you once again. It was just wonderful. Thanks thank so much, much, Emily. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you and good night.